We are a nation hooked on pills and medicinal quick fixes. Our health service spends billions of pounds on drugs that we might not need. The food hospital is the first of its kind, dedicated to treating illness solely through food. Pioneering this radical approach are three medical professionals who will treat conditions ranging from diabetes to depression and Crohn's disease to chronic fatigue. The Food Hospital is on the front line of the Food as Medicine revolution. This week's patients include a photographer with a disabling disease which could spell the end of her career. And how about if you put your neck backwards? Is that as far as you can yeah. go? Pain kicks in at right. that point. So you stop yourself, obviously. Yeah. A teenager who's scared of vegetables. It's like a big spy just sitting there. And a bodybuilding couple who eat meat for breakfast, lunch and supper. If there's too much protein in the diet, your body can't store it, and so you can run into troubles. Dr Pixie McKenna investigates the science behind do-it-yourself food intolerance tests. Hilariously, I've got a little bit of intolerance to tea. That's a big problem because I probably drink 20 cups of tea a day. With your help, the Food Hospital takes sometimes controversial science and puts it to the test to discover just how far our health can be affected by what we eat. Today's first patient has a condition which affects an estimated 70% of menopausal women. My name's Anne Collins, um, I'm 55 and I suffer from terrible hot flushes. Anne, like many women going through the change of life, experiences intense heat rising through the body to the face, leading to sweating, difficulty sleeping and heart palpitations. I find life very, very hard. I can't concentrate, I can't motivate myself. It's awful. I mean, if I could do anything to get rid of them, um, I would. I just can't stand having them anymore. Anne lives in Hampshire and runs an after-school cookery club for kids. Caster sugar is the soft sugar. If we put the other sugar in, which is granulated sugar, we'd have very crunchy chocolate brownies. The average woman living in the UK becomes menopausal at 51, meaning the end of ovulation and menstruation. I'm hot and bothered. <laughs> right now, guys. Oh, look at me, oh, look at me. When I'm having a hot flush, if the children are there, I probably don't say anything. Uh, but when the parents come and collect the children, I quite often say, oh, I'm just having a hot flush. That is a perfect brownie, guys. It's almost endless. How long am I going to have these hot flushes for? You know, I just want to be rid of them. After six years of suffering, Anne is desperate for help. Prior to coming to the food hospital, GP Gio Mileto gave her a special wrist monitor to chart her body temperature over the course of a typical day. So we got you to wear this device here. And what this does is measure the conductivity of your skin. So if you look here, the first thing to note is that you've got a lot of episodes yeah. of hot flushing. Yeah. And I think this must have been a bad day because you were having yeah. about sort of probably about 30 or 40. It was a bad day. Yeah. Menopausal hot flushes can be caused by plummeting levels of the female sex hormone oestrogen. In many cases, these oestrogen levels can be restored by using HRT. Now, have you ever taken hormone replacement therapy? Yes, I was on it for three years, but I had a mammogram and they found a lump, so I was told to come off it. Tell me about the other things that you've tried. The latest one was a magnet attached to my knickers. Um, you put a magnet where? <laughs> it attached to your knickers. One bit on one side and the other bit on the other side. And apparently it's something to do with the magnetism of it. Right. That's not a vajazzle. <laughs> All I noticed was that, you know, I'd go shopping and I'd get um, attached to shopping trolleys and things like that. So, but when you're that desperate, and, and I mean desperate, you're going to try anything. Walking around with a magnet down her knickers tells me just how desperate Anne is to try and relieve some of these hot flushes she gets. Now, the problem is a lack of oestrogen, not a lack of magnetism. So what I'd like her to do is to try a food plan to try and replace some of these oestrogens naturally, especially if she can't take hormone replacement therapy. HRT may not be safe for women with oestrogen-sensitive breast lumps, but some research suggests that diets high in safer plant-based oestrogen 
might help hot flushes. If you want to help your menopause with food, you should see your GP for advice or possibly a referral to a dietitian. Lucy has designed an oestrogen-rich food plan for Anne, which might be able to regulate her body temperature. Can I just say I'm actually having a hot flush now? Are you? <laughs> I can actually feel it coming up my Brewing body. Up. Yeah, yeah, I don't know if I look hot. Or... Yes, you're starting yeah, to look starts, a bit red on the chest. It starts on my chest. Yeah, and then I does feel, it flush up to yeah, your face? Yeah, I can feel my head is, is really burning. Mm. How long does this last for once it's um, risen up? Sometimes. This could probably last for about 10 minutes. Mm. It, it might go down a bit and then, it will cut, and then I'll get another one. If you mm. suffer from hot flushes, typical triggers to avoid include alcohol, caffeine and chilli. This could be a blow to Anne, as she loves curry, but Lucy is showing her a chilli-free version using oestrogen-rich tofu. The next thing we're going to add in to our aromatic curry is some edamame beans. Have you had I these before? One. Yes, please, no, go I ahead. Haven't. The great things about edamame beans is they're another source of soya, so they're, again, going to help those hot flushes. That's the point of putting these in. As well as foods rich in soya, Lucy also wants Anne to eat chickpeas, also high in oestrogen and dairy, broccoli and cabbage, which are good for calcium. Would you like to give it a try? Mmm, it's lovely. I'm really glad mm. you think so. So, Anne, what we're looking for next time is yeah. a reduction in the frequency and the intensity of those hot flushes you've been suffering with. That would be fantastic. Thank you. I feel that the diet's really going to help my symptoms. You know, I'm really excited. I'm sort of buzzing, really. I can't wait to start and give it a go. Anne will return to the food hospital in 10 weeks' time to see if her oestrogen-rich food plan has helped to improve her symptoms. I'm Dr Pixie McKenna, and this week I'm investigating food intolerance test kits. Do you think you're intolerant to certain foods? Can consuming bread or milk make you feel tired or bloated? A growing industry claims to be able to identify whether we're intolerant to a whole host of foods. You can buy lots of tests online, with some websites claiming that over 70% of us are intolerant to at least one food. But what is the hard science behind these tests? And can they really determine whether I shouldn't eat certain foods? I really do think everyone has their own sort of type of food intolerance. I know that some people's um, bodies can't deal with certain foods like wheat. I've been really ill from eating nuts before. I've never had one myself. I get symptoms of, that make me uncomfortable when I have milk or, or things that contain lactose in them. If I eat cucumber, I'm sick for like three days. I'm allergic to celery. My tongue starts to go all weird and bump in. I don't know where that started from. I don't think I'm intolerant to any foodstuffs but I'm curious to know for sure. So I'm going to try some home test kits myself. This one is going to test for 59 common foods that cause intolerance. This test claims that a small blood sample can identify antibodies that may cause an intolerance to everyday foods, ranging from cow's milk to chicken to carrots. So the results have come through. Now we've got some reactivity on oat, wheat, Rice, pork, I'm intolerant to. Carrots are bad as well. Hilariously, I've got a little bit of intolerance to tea, which if I have, that's a big problem because I probably drink 20 cups of tea a day. In fact, the results say I'm intolerant to 25 everyday foods. The things I appear to be most intolerant of certainly constitute an really, really high part of my diet and I wouldn't have any symptoms that I would think are suggestive of food intolerance. I did another test and I pulled some of my hairs out of my head and I sent it off and had it analysed. This test claims to be able to detect food intolerances using hair and electromagnetic waves. So that's two food intolerance tests and only one of me. Will the results match? My hair test says I'm fine with pork, whereas this test says I should steer clear of pork. The test I've just done on my blood tells me that I'm potentially intolerant to cow's milk. My hair test says I'm fine with cow's milk. It, it's very confusing, very, very confusing. My hair test results don't match my blood test results. So I think it's really time to get advice from an expert. 
Later, I'll be speaking to one of the NHS's leading allergy experts to get to the bottom of this DIY approach. There's a certain danger in people immediately assuming food intolerance. The food hospital's next patient is afflicted with a condition so hard to diagnose, half a million of us could have it without knowing. I'm Kate Swerdlow, I'm 39 years old from Liverpool and I have ankylosing spondylitis. This disease is a form of arthritis, which usually attacks the spine, in severe cases causing serious deformity, leaving patients hunched in what's known as the question mark posture. AS is also associated with scarring of the lung and heart problems. I've had it since I was probably about 18 years old, but I wasn't diagnosed until I was 30. The pain that I've gone through can really be, you know, quite upsetting. Ankylosing spondylitis most commonly starts between the ages of 15 and 35. And for Kate, a professional photographer, it has got steadily worse over the last 20 years. I want you to keep your body to me, but actually looking over there is lovely. <laughs> That's nice. That's good. That all works. I started um, feeling very, very painful in my knees and in my hips, and it started working up my body. Relax your shoulders. You can see they're a bit tight. From my lower back to my neck has fused. My mobility has, has become pretty bad. Sometimes I feel like I'm wearing a belt around my chest that is so tight that someone's put their foot in my chest and they're tightening that belt. <laughs> there was a brief phase of optimism when Kate found out that her mystery back pain was a genuine condition. When I was first diagnosed, it was actually the best thing that had ever happened to me because I have felt that I'm dealing with this fantasy illness. What's frustrating is that everybody can see it's happened to my body. You know, they do know that I have got something wrong with me. It feels like I've pulled this name out of the bottom of my bag and gone, this is my ailment, you know, this is my ailment. But after diagnosis, Kate found out there's no miracle cure. Currently consigned to a life of anti-inflammatory painkillers, she's come to the food hospital looking for a new way to manage her symptoms. Having referred Kate for spinal tests, Geo starts by showing what her condition is doing to her vertebrae. I think it's worth having a look at this um, model here. What we're talking about in you is a loss of this blue cartilage. So this is the normal bone, and this cartilage here gets worn down and inflamed. Not only is that painful in itself, it leads to reduced movement in the joints, and it also can lead to long-term deformities of the posture and joints. So if we look at your x-ray here, the alignment of the bones goes off. So here they're nice and straight, and then they kind of go at an angle, at another angle here, and that's representative of the bone kind of collapsing onto itself. So if we look at the range of movements that you've got, can you put your chin on your chest, for example? Because that's as far as you can go. Yeah. Okay, and how about if you put your neck backwards? Again, is that as far as you can go? Yeah, the, pain is, the pain kicks in at right. that point. Right, so you stop yourself, obviously. Yeah. Now, if you turn towards your left, that's, again, that's the restricted movement. Because yeah. most people go to look over their shoulder. Yeah, yeah. You I, could, have to start you're starting to turn your, body, your whole body yeah, now. At that point, yeah. That's probably sort of 10 or 15 degrees of movement, and you'd expect to see at least 30. And what about putting your ear towards your shoulder? This is the, one of the most uh, painful things yeah. and limited of my movements. I mean, it's just a few degrees, really. Yeah. And you know, normally you expect to be able to do that a lot more. Then you're starting to move your whole body in order yeah. to achieve that. Yeah. So, so let's have a look at the rest of your spine. Do you mind taking your T-shirt off? Sure. And if you just turn around for me, and if you twist to your left, OK, and to your right, so that's fairly restricted. I mean, you're moving just a few degrees, and what we're seeing there a lot of is movement in the shoulder. The actual spine itself is almost completely stiff. And how does that affect you day to day? Come two, three o'clock in the afternoon, it starts to kick in. I mean, what about other areas? I know it's a bit personal, but what about things like, you know, sex life? I, I feel like an old woman. I, 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 there's nothing, there's nothing virile about me whatsoever. Um, well, you feel that? I feel that, definitely. It's, it's, it's upsetting. So on a scale of one to ten, during the week, 10 being the worst pain, what would be your sort of highest score? 
Oh, I'd say seven or eight at the end of each day. That's with Currently. my uh, anti-inflammatory medication. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you're taking medication to try and control this inflammation. You're also under the care of a specialist. Yeah. But what we want to look at is to see if there's any dietary changes that may improve or relieve your symptoms. There's a theory uh, that's been published in a number of papers within the scientific community. And the idea is that by reducing starch in the diet, you can improve the symptoms. This controversial approach, a hotly debated topic amongst doctors, is based on the belief that AS may be partly caused by and therefore could be alleviated through the use of food. I'd like you to try a starch exclusion food plan. Now this is pretty controversial. However, someone her age really ought not to be dependent on painkillers almost every day. This theory claims that when people with ankylosing spondylitis digest starchy foods like bread, a type of bacteria called Klebsiella, feed on it and then multiply. Possibly for genetic reasons, AS sufferers' immune systems react by making antibodies, which attack not just the bacteria, but also collagen in the lower spinal joints, causing inflammation and pain. The aim is that by eating less starch, the body produces fewer antibodies and symptoms can be controlled. But this theory is as yet unproven, and as starch is vital for our well-being, Lucy will give Kate some strict guidelines to ensure she eats a fully balanced diet. Most of it is things that we'd really happily tell people to include as part of a, a balanced diet. It's things that are healthy for you, for what we base every meal and snack on, and there's a good reason why the general population shouldn't follow a low starch diet. Starches are a fantastic source of fibre, so they stop you getting constipated, and they can protect against bowel cancer. And they're a really important source of B vitamins as well. And this is why people that want to approach a diet like this should always be seen by a dietitian who can support them through it. Although carbohydrates should make up approximately a third of the plate in a healthy, balanced diet, Lucy is recommending Kate eliminate as many starchy carbs as possible. This will include potatoes and starchy vegetables, rice, pasta and all wheat products. She can eat small amounts of beans, pulses and bananas, with caution, as they contain small amounts of starch. Of course, the things that you can have lots of is meat and fish, because there's no starch in those. You can have things like most fruits and vegetables, things like dairy products and nuts and seeds as well. Yeah. This, this really does give a great illustration of food as medicine, because although all of this is fairly experimental at the moment, actually, if we can achieve this, what we're hoping is that long term, this is going to reduce your disability and help slow the progression of this really disabling condition that you've been suffering with for a long time. Kate will return to the food hospital in six weeks' time to see if her controversial low-starch food plan has had any effect on her back pain. I'm feeling a bit anxious about the change that I hopefully will take on as a long-term plan for myself. I've got, you know, hopefully, please God, another 30, 40 years of, my, of a healthy life to live. Anyone with AS who wants to follow this diet should contact their consultant first. For more information, see the Food Hospital website. I'm Dr Pixie McKenna and today I'm looking at food intolerance test kits. So far, I've tried two widely available tests. Although they gave me differing results, both say I'm intolerant to foods that I eat regularly without feeling ill. Now I'm hoping to find out from one of the country's leading allergy experts whether these tests can provide reliable results. Can specific tests tell me if I'm intolerant to particular foods? Because I've done a few which I've bought off the internet and I was just wondering if they're worthwhile or worth the money. I find it distressing that these tests are available out there. We've established that you enjoy most of these foods and they don't cause you symptoms. Why should you eliminate them from your diet? Food allergies can be potentially fatal, but are easier to diagnose with well-established antibody skin patch tests, like the ones used at Professor Lack's clinic. So here we go. This one's going to be a little bit itchy. But food intolerances are harder to diagnose, and it's believed that they can be mistakenly confused with underlying medical conditions. You are being such a superstar. <laughs> so when it comes to detecting food intolerances, Professor Lack prefers a traditional, long-term doctor-patient relationship. 
any test uh, in intolerance is useless unless it's in the context of a very careful clinical history. And um, there's a certain danger in people ass immediately assuming food intolerance. Uh, when certain symptoms arise, such as fatigue or abdominal discomfort, uh, people immediately think of food intolerance, whereas, whereas there are other uh, avenues that need to be explored. And I have not seen any substantive body of evidence saying that you can use these tests to diagnose food intolerances. This is quite distressing because we see a number of young adults, and particularly children, um, uh, get a battery of some of these unproven tests, and they are then put on multiple food exclusion diets. And to suddenly remove 10 or 20 foods from a person's diet can actually be nutritionally compromising. Uh, if you have symptoms that are very clearly related to ingestion of the food. You clearly need to seek medical advice and if multiple foods are suspected, all the more reason to do that under the supervision of a specialist and particularly a dietitian to make sure that your, your overall uh, diet and health isn't compromised. So clearly not something that you can do in the comfort of your own bathroom? No, not a good idea. <laughs> spend £50 on a food intolerance test that may give you an incorrect result. If you feel that a certain food may make you feel bloated or tired, then why not cut it out or try an elimination diet, but always remember to do so under the supervision of a healthcare professional. The next patient feels and appears healthy but she is worried that her very restricted diet could be causing her serious long-term harm. My name's Tay Giles, I'm 19 years old, I'm from Maidstone in Kent and I've never eaten a vegetable in my life. There's a chance that like two million other people in the UK, Tay might be suffering from malnutrition. Typical symptoms of a poor diet can include a distended stomach, pale eyes and skin rashes. Also, a lack of iron could result in anemia and deformed fingernails. And low vitamin C levels can lead to scurvy and ultimately to organ failure. The only foods I do actually eat are chips, bacon, sausages, Yorkshire puddings and pancakes, and bread, sweets, ice cream and crisps, really. Tay's very limited diet doesn't impact on her active lifestyle, but it is affecting her relationships. I don't eat with my family, I try to not eat with my friends because it's embarrassing and I hate it and I'm really determined to kind of fix the problem I have but it's just finding the right people that can help me because no one seems to be able to understand and help me at the moment. Knowing she must change her eating habits, Tay has come to the food hospital to see Lucy and consultant surgeon Shaw Summers who's amazed at Tay's career choice. Now you're a fitness instructor at the moment how do you keep your energy out? I've never ever kind of felt like I haven't got any energy. I've never felt that my diet actually affects me at all. And that's what most people find quite strange, is like, mm. how do you keep up what you do? I'm constantly active and constantly busy, and, but I, ne I never feel kind of worn down mm. from it. I don't think I've ever met a fitness instructor that's never eaten a vegetable. It's no. quite, <laughs> quite unusual. Yeah. A typical breakfast, glass of lemonade and a sausage sandwich. And actually for a lunch, cookie dough ice cream. Wow. I see you eat like sausage and chips quite a lot. Yeah, that's normally from like the chip shop. Tay's problems started as a child when severe acid reflux made her intolerant of many foods, which has led to an increasing phobia of most foods. Well, every time I ate when I was younger, I was sick. And obviously being sick is not a very nice experience. And when you're doing it kind of 10, 20 times a day, it's just, you'd rather just not eat. So like kind of thinking about eating it, it, it kind of really does make me feel uneasy, just all because it used to make me sick and it's just got worse and worse and worse. Before she came to the food hospital, Tay took some blood tests so Shaw could analyse the extent of her possible malnutrition. There are some tests which show us how your red cells are constructed and it shows us that you've got quite large red blood cells. That's really a reflection of the fact that your vitamin B12 level is quite low. But there are also some other quite striking deficiencies because of the lack of vegetables in your diet. Probably the most interesting one is that a real lack of vitamin C. Normally you would expect a level of over 11 and your level is uh, just below 6, so it's nearly half the level you need to be. 
these deficiencies mean that Tay is malnourished and at serious risk of debilitating anemia and scurvy. And although she takes supplements, they aren't necessarily a convenient solution to her problem. It's the balance of these nutrients. When we get it from food, it gives it to your body in the right proportions. But when you take a pill, too high levels of one thing actually stop you absorbing another thing and can cause deficiencies in itself. The simplest way for Tay to get the vital nutrients her body needs is to expand her diet from beige-coloured foods like chips, sausages, bread and pancakes to incorporate foods of all colours. Red things are fantastic for compounds like lycopene, and this helps to protect against free radicals which can cause cancer. Purple and blue things are actually really high in anthocyanins which help your circulatory system and help to keep your heart healthy. Orange, that's great for skin and also eyesight. Green is really high in antioxidants and white also is, is fantastic for antibacterial properties. So you can see there's so many different things that you just won't get from a pill. I really feel for you, when most people have a phobia of something, we can avoid it be it spiders or heights or whatever it is, for you, food is always going to be in your life. So there's no running away from this one. You, we're going to have to face it because otherwise it's going to plague you forever. By introducing new colourful foods into her life one by one, Lucy hopes that Tay may slowly start to lose her fear of vegetables. I just want to be healthy. I, I just want to be like everybody else. I just want, I want to be normal-ish. But will there be any improvement in her eating habits when she returns to the food hospital in five weeks' time? Anne came to the food hospital looking for a food-based solution to her menopausal hot flushes. Trying out her food plan, which was rich in plant-based oestrogen, was a welcome challenge. I was really, really excited when I came home. I was buzzing. I couldn't wait to get started. Hello, lovely. Come in. And the cookery teacher has even been trying out some of her new recipes on her friends. Here, I'll have some nibbles. Um, these are soya. We're going to have some vegetables. So I've got almonds, because I've been told almonds are very good for me. I'm adding a lot of soya in as well. And that's what helps the hot flushes. I don't want to fall off the wagon every day now before I go shopping. I think about what, what I'm going to eat. But although adding soya to her eating plan has been easy enough, cutting down on her hot flush triggers hasn't been such plain sailing. Do you want the wine then? Oh, yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, yeah. I did cheat a little bit. I was restricted to one glass of wine a day and there were some days where I had a little bit more than that. Cheers. I know when I have a glass of wine, I'm going to have a hot flush. You know, I, I do really well during the day, and then of an evening, if I had a glass of wine, boom, a great big hot flush would appear. The biggest things that I'm missing are my curries, because they were a very large part of my life. But I don't have to not have them. Um, you know, I've just changed the way that I cook things. Despite the occasional lapse, Anne has been wearing the wristband Geo gave her to monitor her episodes. Every hot flush, um, I press this very, very lightly. When this is taken back and um, put, put into the computer, it will show how many hot flushes that I'm actually having. When I first had this watch, I think I ran the battery out probably within about a day because I had so many of them. But will her hot flushes have subsided at all when Anne returns to the food hospital in just a couple of weeks' time? I love quinoa. Since coming to the food hospital, Kate has been busy getting rid of all the starch-heavy foods from her store cupboard, hoping to relieve the symptoms of her ankylosing spondylitis. Things like rice, I probably um, won't have that again. Um, the muesli I thought was going to be something that would be fine for me to continue eating. I've made this myself. I've, I've got to get rid of that too. It's sad. That's all right. I like fresh fruit. <laughs> oh well. Now, six weeks after her first visit, she's returned to tell Gio whether or not her controversial low-starch food plan has made any difference to her back pain. Kate, welcome back. So, tell us how you've been. I'd say, on the whole, I'm you know, my well-being has, um, has improved. The big pain 
actually has subsided. So previously you were having three or four flare-ups during the week where the pain got really bad mm -hmm. and how's that been? I have probably had one or two huge flare-ups. So that's during a, a, a six, six week period? Yeah, absolutely. So that's quite a massive improvement. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd say that, you know, all around I'm feeling a lot better than, you know, than I have done. So how do you feel about being part of a slightly controversial experiment? Are you going to keep going with the diet? 100 percent. It's definitely something I can I can run with for the, you know, for the foreseeable future. I realise that it's a long term commitment and um, to see um, a massive change. I know that I've got to, you know, maintain it to, to get the benefits of it. But it's still quite early days and you're doing very well, I think, to have got started and you seem very committed. And I hope that this food and this lifestyle change that you've made uh, would limit the progression and the damage that it's going to do to your joints in the long term. Yes. So, um, well done. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I know there's a lot more in front of me to go, but on a daily basis, I'm, I'm happy to be, you know, the, the, uh, the captain of my own ship, really. Yeah. Although Kate's back pain hasn't gone completely, the food hospital has handed control back to her. And if she can continue her low starch diet, there is a chance she will see a more pronounced improvement in her back pain in the future. Since visiting the food hospital, Tay has been on a slow program of familiarization of the colorful foods that have been missing from her diet her whole life. She needs to overcome her food phobia to defeat her severe malnutrition, but she must take it step by step. OK, so I've got strawberries and firstly what I have to do is I look at them, see how I feel about that. And once I've got comfortable like looking at them, I would then kind of go to pick one up. So I'd pick one up and I'd just kind of feel it and like feel the texture. And then when I get used to that, I'd then like kind of smell it. When I become comfortable with that, I'd uh, put the wet bit just on my lip. And then eventually I cut it into much smaller pieces. So I can kind of put it in my mouth and I can eat it and swallow it. It's vital Tay starts to eat a broad range of foods. So as well as strawberries, she's also getting to grips with carrots and cheese. Once I've conquered all three of them, I then move down the list. So next in my dairy is yogurt, next on fruit is orange, oranges, and next on vegetables is uh, broccoli. <laughs> broccoli is not that great. It just kind of makes me feel like, ugh. It's like someone, a big spy just sitting there and someone having to look at it. Will the terrified teen finally overcome her food fears and start eating the balanced diet her body needs before she returns to the food hospital? It's five weeks since 19-year-old Tay came to the food hospital with malnutrition due to her phobia of all fruit and vegetables. Today, she's back to tell Lucy and Shaw whether or not she's managed to expand her diet to include any healthier, colourful foods. Hi Tay, and welcome back to the food hospital. Can I ask, what progress have you made? I kind of overcome cheese, and I try and eat cheese Great. as much as I can, and strawberries and carrots as well. For a girl that had never eaten a fruit or veg, yeah. strawberries and carrots has come a long mm. way. Yeah. And they're going to be giving you that vital vitamin C that you were missing, and also other nutrients that are contained in orange and red fruits and vegetables, which is really going to boost your health for the future. I'm really pleased that cheese has come into your diet because that will contain some vital calcium that is really important for your bone health. And how long did that take you to get from the, the point where you're, you can just look at a food to actually being able to have a little bit? Um, about three weeks. Three can, weeks. Yeah. So we can see this is obviously going to be a long old slog for you, but I think the steps that you have taken have been amazing and I, I think you're doing brilliantly. So you can recognise that the phobia is going out of the food bit by bit. Yeah, I try and not avoid it now. I try and put myself in situations where I'm around it. And I mean, the initial fear is still there, but it's kind of um, how I deal with it now. It feels quite good knowing that I'm kind of actually going forward and adding foods to my diet and that it is going to get better one day and I'll be able to just do everything I want to do. So, yeah, it's, it is good. That's great.
Loads of people have phobias of food. I think it just kind of shows that however bad the problem is, that there is a way around it. Even if it's just little changes, it can just make your life so much better. The food hospital has given Tay the tools she needs to continue expanding her diet to include more nutritious foods of all colours of the rainbow. The next food hospital patients are international bodybuilders who want some guidance on their high-protein training diets. We both bodybuilders. Uh, we're born in Portugal. We've been living in the UK for the last seven years. In the build-up to big competitions, Rob and Vanda up their protein levels massively to build their muscle mass. Wanting to know if their training diets are affecting their overall health, they've recorded a food diary for Lucy. First thing in the morning, 10 egg whites. That's right. 225 grams of fillet steak right. and 150 grams of porridge oats. That's right. Which is like three big bowls for, right. for an average person. Right. Meal two, 300 grams of lean turkey, 300 grams of baked potato. That's right. Wow. What time's that? Every two and a half hours. Every two hours. Yeah, we'd pro the first meal is doing six or seven. So you'd be having your turkey and baked potato at about eight or nine in the morning. Yeah, yeah. roughly. Yeah. <laughs> meal three. 300 grams of lean, skinless chicken. Yes, yes. 300 grams of sweet potato, so, so more yes. protein and, and complex carbs. Okay, meal four, very similar. That's right. Meal five, chicken, That's sweet right. potato. Meal six, turkey, white rice. Meal seven, white fish and six asparagus spears. That's right. And meal eight, lean beef mince or fillet steak again. That's right. A mixed salad, and that's it. That's <laughs> Wow, it's over 4,000 calories. I wouldn't necessarily call what you're following a healthy diet for a normal person, of because obviously no. it has a specific purpose. Yes. And for the general public, I would never advise this. Of course, I totally agree with that. But despite their tough training regime, Rob and Vanda's extreme diet may be too protein heavy. Every cell in the human body contains protein. It is a major part of the skin, organs and glands. Most of us need two to three moderate servings of protein-rich food per day, but Rob and Vanda are consuming eight huge portions. If there's too much protein in the diet, the excess protein isn't used to build muscle. Your body can't store it, and so you can run into troubles like having kidney stones and things like that. So a bodybuilder has to match the amount of protein they're taking in with the amount of muscle bulking they need to do. But the enormous amount the couple eat isn't only giving them a protein overdose, it's also delivering higher than normal amounts of dietary cholesterol. The body needs good cholesterol to function. It's in cell membranes, insulates nerve fibres and makes hormones. But bad cholesterol, known as the silent killer, can cause heart disease. Rob and Vanda eat so much meat that they're consuming more than four times the amount of cholesterol recommended by dietitians. Although it's possible they have higher levels of cholesterol for genetic, not diet reasons, it's likely that their extreme diet is contributing to it. A healthy blood cholesterol reading should be under 5. 6.1. Now, technically, that would be quite high. 5.07. So that's a top end of normal. Now, you see, my take on this is that you two are two incredibly fit people. And I would anticipate that your cholesterol levels would be low. And in fact, they're not. And that surprises me. And I think, you know, it, it could demonstrate that there is a link between your, your quite extreme dietary cholesterol intake and your own cholesterol in your blood. Well, look, guys, you are two of the most extreme eaters that I have ever come across. And I really hope it pays off for you in your competitions. I wish you all the best. Yeah, best Thank of luck. You. Thank you. Thank you. Rob and Vanda's diets just illustrate the extremes to which you can push the digestive system. They eat an enormous amount of food and combined with the exercise, it results in a remarkable bodybuilding capacity. But they have to be so careful that they don't overdo certain elements of their diet and run into medical problems longer term. They may have planned their diets carefully for their punishing training regimes, but it seems that Rob and Vanda's massive intake could lead to long-term health problems in the future. If you want to start a radical fitness food plan, it's important to see your GP who can refer you to a dietitian if required. It's 
nine weeks since Anne came to the food hospital looking for a food-based treatment for her menopausal hot flushes. Now she's back to tell Gio and Lucy how she's got on with her plant-based oestrogen food plan. Anne, welcome back. Hello. Very nice to see you again. Nice to see you. Tell us about how it's been going. Specifically, the symptom of hot flushes. How's yeah. that been? Oh, they're so much better. I'm pleased to say that's actually confirmed by yes. the test that you've done. So if we look here, previously, this was a measure of how many hot flushes you were getting. So yeah. it's extremely frequent. I mean, I think we worked out that it was at least, at least one or two an hour. This is the current one here. <laughs> and as you can see, there's, what, a handful, yeah. six maybe, marks. So this, this matches up very nicely with yeah. what you're describing. You know, it's, mm. you know, it's, it's definitely for real. Mm. Amazing, absolutely amazing. And um, how's it made you feel? I'm feeling so much better in myself. The hot flushes were embarrassing because it was a sign of the menopause, mm. a sign of getting old. But because I'm channeling all this healthy food into my body, I'm feeling more confident. I feel my skin feels better and everything. So when I have a hot flush, I just don't feel quite so embarrassed and I, I can almost own up to having one. You can wear your flush badge with pride. Yes. <laughs> We're all going to age at some time, aren't we? It's just, you've just got to get on with life, but, but make life bearable. And if there's changes that you have to make, if it's going to give you a better life and you're going to feel more healthy, then um, it's well worth doing. That's a very positive attitude. I'm very pleased for you. I was really excited to see that it has actually been proven that the diet that I've been on has helped me through my menopause. Anne's natural oestrogen rich food plan has provided a great outcome for her and for the food hospital in its quest to promote the benefits of food as medicine.